Very good evening uh, to you all and a really warm welcome to our uh, regular Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, this evening we are looking again through the Gospel according to Mark uh, tonight and we are continuing uh, this evening at chapter 14. We've been looking at it for this last couple of weeks and we've called it the chapter of preparation. Everybody is preparing for the events that will come uh, in, a, in a few days time, the crucifixion. Uh, and then the resurrection of Jesus. And so this is a chapter of preparation. And we have looked uh, at the preparation that the, the chief priests have made and the scribes have made. And then last week we looked at the preparation of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who anoints the head of Jesus and the feet of Jesus with an alabaster jar full of perfume, costing, as we, we looked at last week, many thousands of pounds, an extravagant act of worship. This week, um, I want us to stay on that story, on Mary's uh, story, and look uh, once again just at one of the verses, uh, one of the, the things that Jesus says in response to the criticism of his disciples, because, and it's found in verse 7 of Mark 14. And I want to look at it again this week because I think it's an important one for us to understand because it has the potential to shape the way that we live our Christian lives and we prioritise the things that we do in our Christian lives. So it's worth a, a second look, this one, before we leave Mary behind and go on to the next group of people who were preparing for the crucifixion of Jesus. So I want to remind you of the story of Mary and her extravagant act of worship. So we'll read it together as we did last week from Mark chapter 14. And it says this, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. And there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticised her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone, and why do you trouble her? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could, and she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. That's the story that we looked at in detail um, last week, the story of Mary and her anointing of the head and the feet of Jesus. And then verse 7 again, which is right in the middle of it, which is Jesus' response to the criticism that this was too extravagant act, that it would have been, they would have been better off selling this alabaster jar of perfume for the thousands that it was worth, and then those thousands could be um, distributed among the poor and the needy, those who would have need of them. It was a critic, and Mark says they criticised her not in a in a soft way or in a trivial way, but they criticised her sharply because of what she had done. And this is what Jesus says uh, in response in verse seven. He says, "For you have the poor with you always." And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not always have. And it's that verse that I'd like us to just spend a few moments on uh, this evening. Because as I said, I think it has the potential, whichever way we understand it, it has the potential to affect the way we live our Christian lives and affect the way that we act together as Christians and even as a church. I've rarely heard this verse preached on to be honest, but as I've thought of it this week and its importance, I suppose you could come at it from one or two different ways, each of which would have a profound effect on the way that you lived your Christian life. You could argue, you look at the verse and you could argue that Jesus was saying, look, poverty is too big a problem to solve. It's too great an issue. When you look around the nation of Israel as Jesus and his disciples were in, and even as you look around the world, poverty is so massive, it's such a, a huge problem that we'll never solve it. And you could think, well, Jesus was saying, well, what's the point of trying to solve it? What's the point of 
giving to the poor? What's the point of meeting needs? Because you'll never solve the problem. The problem is too big for me and you. It's too big for society. It's too big, certainly too big for the church. So what's the point in trying? You could argue that Jesus was saying, look, even a year's wages, which this alabaster jar full of perfume was worth, even a year's wages is just a drop in the ocean to this overwhelming problem. So you might as well forget about it. You might as well sort of write it off as a bad job and spend your time and your money doing something else. And in this case of this story, the something else was the worship of Jesus. So you could read it and, and understand it to mean that Jesus was saying, look, this problem of poverty is always going to be here. You're never going to solve it. So why try? And why put your resource in that area? And why put your money in that area? You might as well just forget that and concentrate on other things that you can do. In this case, the worship of Christ as he was approaching the cross. That's one way perhaps we could think of it this evening. So was Jesus saying that? Are the words, do the words that Jesus said mean that? Was that his, his meaning? Forget about the poor. It's too big a problem and you'll never solve it. Well, as you, you look at this um, verse in its context and, and perhaps just as importantly as you look at it in the context of, of the ministry of Jesus, in Mark as a whole, and even in the Bible as a whole, which we have to do here in a Bible study, we have to remember that we are looking at a bigger picture. We're not just looking at one verse, and not just even looking at one book. We are looking at the whole of the Bible. Then I think we wouldn't, in all honesty, be able to say, look, Jesus is meaning, forget about the poor because it's far too big a problem. I certainly don't think that's what Jesus is saying for, for two really important reasons. Reason number one, if he was saying that, that would be totally inconsistent with so much of what he has said in the past, with so much of Jesus's ministry and his words up until this point. Because we have to be honest, we have to realise that Jesus spends a lot of his teaching stressing the importance of helping those who are in need and helping those who are suffering and helping those who have physical need of resources. Matthew chapter 25 contains that famous passage that is said around, around about the time that, that Mark uh, 14 is talking about too. Jesus says in Matthew 25 in that very challenging and very famous passage, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and then did not minister to you? And then he will say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Now that, when we, you hear the words of Jesus, the same person who says the words in, in Mark, Mark 14 and verse 7 is speaking here, the same Jesus, the same Lord. Now when you read his words in Matthew, it doesn't sound at all like Jesus is saying, don't worry about poverty and don't worry about physical needs and don't worry about meeting the temporal needs and the suffering of those who are around and about you. It's not as if Jesus is saying for a moment, look, this is too big a problem. It's too big an issue. So do something else. In fact, as you read Matthew 25 and as you read it with honesty, then it sounds very much like Jesus is personally identifying with each and every person who suffers and is making a plea to his followers that they aid and they help wherever they see such suffering and they do it in his name. And so we have to be consistent in our thinking of Jesus. Jesus just doesn't change his opinion from Matthew 25 to Mark 14. So we can't think that Jesus is, is saying, forget about the poor, that's too big a problem, because it would be inconsistent with the rest of his teaching. The second reason, though, and this is an interesting one, I think, 
is, is the fact that Jesus' words in, in Mark 14 and verse 7 are at least a partial quotation from a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 15, which goes deeper, I think, in explaining his meaning. This is what Jesus says. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good, but me you do not always have. Now this is the verse from Deuteronomy 15 and verse 11. It says this, the poor will never cease from the land. You know, that, that's pretty much exactly what Jesus says in Mark 14 and verse 7. The poor will never cease from this land. You'll always have the poor. The poor will never cease from this land. And then God goes on to make a command after he says this. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open you a hand wide to your brother, to you a poor and you a needy in the land. So this verse, far apart from saying you'll always have the poor, so don't worry about them and forget about them and go and do something else that is more worthwhile, says, look, you'll always have the poor in the, in the land. And because of that, this is a command from heaven. Open your hand wide to your brother. Open your hand wide to the poor and the needy in the land. So this verse, far from saying that we shouldn't help the poor and we shouldn't aid those who are suffering is that this verse is a direct instruction to do just that to help the poor not that we would alleviate poverty but we would make a difference and we would make difference to personal people that we encounter day by day that we in the name of God that we should open our hands wide and meet needs wherever we see them you know, so to interpret the words of Jesus in Mark to mean that looking after the, the poor is unnecessary, well, that would be a mistake. And if we took it to mean that, and if we, we tried to understand it like that, we wouldn't honestly be looking at what Jesus says. So he doesn't say that. He, he doesn't say, look, this is too big a problem. Forget about it and just concentrate on something else. So if he doesn't say that, then we are still left with that question, what does he mean? What does, what does his words mean? The poor you will always have with you. Now, first of all, as I've, uh, as I've read it and read around it this week, I think Jesus absolutely did mean, literally, that the poor will always be with us. And we, we've come 2,000 years since these words were written, and humanity has become far more sophisticated uh, and it's become richer and it's become wealthier and more intelligent and more forward thinking and more forward looking and all these wonderful things. But it's a sad fact of life that the problem of poverty today is just as bad as it was in the time of Jesus. And the poor who were there in his day and age are there in our day and age, that there were needs that needed to be met but weren't being met in his society and there are needs that need to be met and are not being met in our society too. I think even a person with the, the most rose-tinted glasses would agree with that. Poverty is still an issue. Poverty is still a problem. There is still need. There is still suffering. There are still people who lack. And, and so the words of Jesus are exactly true. It is a sad fact and tragic fact of life that in any human society, there are people with less than others. In any human society, there are people who suffer through lack of, of resource or whatever that might be. Whether that society is, is not very good uh, or great, whatever society is uh, has not eradicated the problem of poverty or the problem of suffering. No one that would tell us that in humanity there will always be greed and there will always be self-interest and where you have those two things there will always be those who need help. There will always be those who suffer from a lack of resource and that's a characteristic I suppose of sinful and fallen humanity. That has been the case from the moment that sin entered the world and I think what Jesus is saying is that's going to be the case until he returns. 
there will always be lack. There will always be need. The poor will always be with us. And because of that, there will never cease to be opportunities for you and me to help. There will never cease to be opportunities where you and I, as Christians, with the greatest of motives, are able to show the love of God in helping wherever we see the need. There'll always be the poor, says Jesus, and there'll always be opportunity for Christians, for followers of his, to help in that situation. I think 100% Jesus was saying those had that literal meaning. But Jesus, though, goes on in Mark 7 and he compares that situation to his own situation. He compares the time that there would be poverty on the earth with the time that he would be there in his physical earthly ministry. And what he says in verse 7 is this, my time, he says, on earth, my time in my physical earthly ministry is limited. And we could agree with that because we read in Mark and we've read about um, the start of his ministry. And in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, depending on how long we are going on a Wednesday, we will come to the end of his earthly ministry. His time, his earthly ministry was limited. And here we are um, at the start of Holy Week and it's fast coming to an end. The three years of his ministry are fast coming to an end and opportunities to worship him like Mary did are getting fewer and fewer. The cross is but days away and so the opportunities to worship Jesus in his physical earthly ministry were getting fewer and fewer. The disciples had a lifetime of looking after the poor to come And as we read the book of Acts, they did that. They spent their lives, they spent their ministry, the church as a whole, looking after the poor, as Jesus had instructed in Matthew 25. So the disciples had a lifetime of that to come, but their time with Jesus in his earthly physical ministry was fast running out. And that's, I suppose, the meaning of Mark 14 and verse 7. The poor you'll always have with you, says Jesus, you'll always have opportunity to provide and to help and to be with them, but you won't always have me. My time, earthly physical ministry, is fast coming to an end. So we can answer that question. That's what Jesus meant in that verse. But then that raises another question. I suppose, and one which remains with us and one which we can ask ourselves this evening or ask the word of God this evening. What does that mean to you and me as we read it today? Now, you and I are not in the same situation as as these disciples were, not in the same situation as the crowd who are around Jesus on that day and see Mary extravagantly worshipping him with this broken alabaster jar. We're not in the same situation as them. We don't know Jesus in the flesh as they knew him in the flesh. We weren't or we're not around at the time of Christ's physical earthly ministry. We don't know Jesus in the flesh. We know him through the spirit as we read God's word and as that declares. We don't know him after the flesh but we know him through the Spirit. He is not here with us in physical earthly ministry as he was with Matthew and Peter and James and John, but he is here with us in his heavenly ministry, if you like, through his Holy Spirit. And so his presence with us is not time bound at all. It was for the disciples, it was a a finite time. A couple or three years they would have of him and they would have the greatest of three years and they would hear him and they would see the most wonderful things. They would go through the most unbelievable of times and unbelievable of sights and then he would be gone and that would be it. But you and I don't have a time-bound relationship with Jesus. 
His presence with you and me is not coming to an end. His presence with you and me is not affected by time at all. In fact, he tells us at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this verse, to you and me, cannot be saying that we should make the most of Jesus now, because soon he'll be gone which is the meaning that the disciples would have would have uh, taken as they read it. What it does remind us of, though, I think, and this is why it's important, it reminds us of what the church is called to. And it reminds us that the church is called to be more than just a physical help to those who need it here in our communities. The church is, is called to be more than a provider of physical help and temporal help. The church is certainly, as we read through the word of God, called to be a force for good and to provide and to help and to comfort. But that isn't all that we've been called for. In fact, the church is called to be a wide variety of different things, each equally as important, none of which we can ignore and none of which we can gloss over. Now, in this next section of our our time, these next few minutes, I'm going to throw a, an, an awful lot of, of quotes at you, of, of verses at you. Um, but that's just the way it is, because, I, because there is a lot of things that I need to back up from the word of God and, and not just tell you, that, well, this, is, this is what I think and this is how I'd like things to be but there are lots of of things that i need to back up saying and saying this is god's word not just my opinion but these are the things that the church is called for or called to in the new testament as i read it anyway you know the church is called to worship god and that's undoubted i think when you read the new testament there is a call a responsibility on you and me to be worshippers, to worship God the way Mary worshipped God, to be a worshipper of Christ like Mary worshipped. Now, as a Christian this evening, I'm called to be a worshipper of God. I am called to give him my praise and my glory because he's deserving of that. And so, as a Christian, I'm called to have a responsibility to be a worshipper of Christ. And there are countless verses in the New Testament that would express that calling and express that thought. I've just picked out two of them. John chapter 4 and verse 23, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. And he says these words to, to her, For the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And so we are called to worship God our Father, to worship him in spirit and in truth. That is what God is seeking in you and me, as we have called and put our faith and our trust in the name and in the sacrifice of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, the writer of Hebrew, Hebrew says this, talking to Christians like you and me. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, so this is not just something that, that Christians do in their spare time, not just a, a hobby or a, a pastime, but this is a calling from God upon us as his church and upon us as Christians, as men and women who have put their faith in his son, that we have a responsibility and a calling to worship him and to glorify him and to thank him and to praise him and to do all these wonderful things that we perhaps naturally do as a church and certainly the way that Mary did. It was natural to her this extravagant, overwhelming overflowing of praise and of worship that's not a trivial thing that's something that God wants from each one of us he wants us to worship 
wants us to praise, wants us to glorify and thank him for all that he is and all that he's done. So the church has been called and Christians have been called to worship God. As we move on from that, the church has been called to teach the ways of God and to learn the ways of God and to study God's word that we might know him better, that we might understand his nature better, his character better, his ways better, his will better, the gospel better. Two verses from Second Timothy would give us that particular calling. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, Paul says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then in the next chapter, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says this, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so it's a calling, an expectation that God has on me and you and upon his church that we look at his word that we spend time looking at his word, that we study his word, that we would know him, that we would be equipped to serve him, that we might understand who he is and what he has done and what his will is for you and me as we walk with him. And so Bible study is not just this optional extra, you know, and it seems to be, doesn't it? There's Bible study seems to be of, of everything in the Christian life. Bible study seems to be the most optional of extras. And the Bible study service is perhaps the most um, poorly attended because people think, well, that's just for people who are really serious about their Christian walk or really serious about their relationship with God when nothing could be further from the truth. It's a calling an expectation that's upon us as Christians that we spend time in God's word, considering it, thinking about it, meditating on it, that we would know him, that we would understand his nature and his characteristics. We would be equipped to serve him, understand what he's done for us, understand what he can do for the world that we see around us. It's a calling an expectation of God. The New Testament tells us another one, another few actually, as we go through this evening. The church is called to fellowship together, to meet together, to pray together, to care for one another, to love one another. Hebrews, and this, this is a famous verse from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 to 25 says this, let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approach. And so the Christian life isn't one to be lived on our own. It's not one to be lived in isolation, but as a community, as a communion, as a fellowship, and Hebrews would tell us that is a calling. Don't stop assembling yourselves together, but carry on. And stir each other up in love. And stir each other up in care and concern. And stir each other up in good works. Be together. Love one another. Care for one another. Worship together. Pray together. Be of one body and of one family. So another calling that the church has to fellowship together, to meet together, to care for one another, to look after one another. And then finally, I, th I suppose we could think of a few more, but the final one I want to look at just this evening, the church is called to evangelize. The church is called to be a witness of Jesus and his gospel, his good news. We've already looked at Matthew 
chapter 28. But there's no greater example, I suppose, than the end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28. The last words that Jesus says to his disciple before he departs and goes back to his father. He says this in Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so the, the church is not just called to fellowship. It's not just called to worship. It's not just called to good works. It's not just called to study. It's called to be the voice or the witness of what Jesus has done. It's called to declare and to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It's called to preach the cross of Christ. It's called to preach um, sins forgiven and the righteousness that is imputed to us from the throne of grace as we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. That's not something that comes natural to people of the world. It's not, not a knowledge that you were born with. It's a knowledge that needs to be declared and needs to be proclaimed. And God could have chosen a thousand and one ways to get his message out there. He could have had the angels sing it in the same way they did to declare the birth of Jesus. But he hasn't chosen that way. He's chosen you and me, his church, and given us this responsibility, given us this calling, this expectation, this command. Go and make disciples of all nations. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Go and be my witnesses, says Jesus in Acts chapter 1. And so, good works of comfort and provision, worship, the study of God's word, fellowship and evangelism, to name but five. That's the calling of the church, the calling of the family of God, the calling of each individual Christian like you and like me. Now, as, as I read that, I start to think, well, it's hard work, this Christianity. God has an awful lot of expectations of me, an awful lot of work to do in my Christian life and in my Christian walk. And I think the issues come about when one of those callings and one of those expectations is done to the detriment of another. Now, God hasn't called us to one of those callings. He's called us to be a church of all of those callings. And issues come when one of those callings is done to the detriment of another. Now, if the best Bush, our church in Claydock Vale, if we went out and fed the poor and clothed the naked and visited the lonely but told no one of the grace of God and the mercy of God and did not proclaim the wonderful victory of the cross of Jesus, then we would be failing in our Christian ministry. And we would be failing the world that we are supposed to be serving. If we did all of the good works part, if we fed the poor and clothed the naked and visited the lonely, but told no one of the goodness of God and the grace of God, the ministry of Jesus and the death of Jesus, then we would be failing in our calling and failing the world that we are supposed to be serving because we would be catering to their temporal needs and we would be ignoring their eternal ones. Now the opposite is true as well. If we preach the gospel, declared the goodness of God, declared the love of God, declared the grace of God, but didn't care and didn't show any concern for anyone and showed no concern for the suffering that we see around and about us, and the suffering in our own community, then our words would come across as cold and as shallow when we do one thing to the detriment of another. So what's the answer then? 
Because this is a, a difficult question in what, what do we prioritise and what do we do as Christians? You know, the, I think the answer is to look at the example of Mary and to put Jesus at the centre. And I think when you do that as a Christian, you are not going to go too far wrong. A church that puts Jesus at the centre is not going to go too far wrong. A Christian who puts Christ at the centre of their life is not going to go too far wrong. A, a person who looks at Jesus as their example and makes him their priority, exactly as Mary did in Mark chapter 14. A church that puts Christ at the centre and in his name seeks to meet needs wherever it sees them, that worships God in spirit and in truth, wholeheartedly and extravagantly, that loves the word of God, that loves the words of Jesus, and let those words settle deep in their hearts and affect the way they live their lives. A church that fellowships together in caring, loving concern for one another, and that declares and proclaims the good news of God's plan of salvation, that's a church that is walking in the footsteps of Jesus, her Saviour. That's a church that has Christ at the centre of everything it does. To look to follow his example, to do what he does, to love like he loves, to be concerned like he is concerned, to declare his glorious and wonderful and amazing good news. That's a church that is walking in the footsteps of her Saviour. That's a church that is taking on his example in the world that we are a part of. It's hard work, this Christianity. It's hard work being part of his glorious church. But when we put him at the centre, make him a, our priority, then we are not going to go too far wrong. We're going to come to a close there. Uh, and God willing, we'll uh, be coming on to, well, we'll be uh, coming on to the next lot of preparations. And the next lot of preparations are made by Judas. There's a, a difference in two people between Mary and Judas, but we'll be looking at Judas, God willing, uh, next week. Just a reminder to you all that we will be uh, again sharing some thoughts on, on God's word um, at 10.30 on Sunday morning. And wonderfully, everything worked really well this Sunday morning and we were able to uh, to fellowship together at, at 10.30. So I'm hopeful uh, that that will be the case next Sunday morning uh, as well. And then, of course, uh, a week today, we will be meeting together again at uh, 7 o'clock next Wednesday evening. Let's close, shall we, with a, a word of prayer. Thank the Lord for being with us uh, this evening as we've looked through his word together and ask him to be with us as we go through these next few days. Lord, we do thank you. Uh, for the joy and the pleasure that there is, Lord, in, in meeting together and coming around you a word. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we we read there, Lord, of, uh, of events that happened such a long time ago. And yet they have an impact on us today. Words that were spoken such a long time ago, and yet they have a meaning to us as we read them today. We thank you for Jesus. We read in this greatest of stories of his story, of his ministry, of his works, of his words. And as we are reading, as we come to these last few chapters in Mark, we are reading of the preparations for the cross. Lord, we realise this Wednesday, as we do every Wednesday, of his great love for the world. And of you a plan of grace and mercy and salvation. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that I am a part of that. My brothers and sisters, I'm sure, can say exactly the same. I thank you, Lord, for, for being a part of your church, being a part of your family. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I'm missing them because I can't physically see them. We can't meet together together. 
on a Sunday and on a Wednesday, Lord, but we are a heavenly family and a body, even in the community that you have placed us. I thank you, Lord, for your wonderful calling. Lord, that you have called your church to be something different and something special. Lord, that it isn't an easy calling. But Lord, I thank you that you continue day by day through your spirit to strengthen us, to equip us, and that we are never on our own. Lord, that you have called us to meet needs where we see them, in your love and in your name. You have called us, Lord, to, uh, to fellowship together, to meet together, to be together, to worship you together, to come around you a word, Lord, and to be uh, learners and studiers of your word, that we might know you in such a great way and understand, Lord, in a, in a greater way what you have done, even for each and every one of us. You have called us to be proclaimers of your word, uh, proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, witnesses to his glorious story. And I pray, Lord, we, as we, we think of that, we think of, of all that entails, we pray, Lord, that you would be with us and you would fill us with your spirit afresh, even this evening, that we might go in, in, out into all the world and do the things that you have called us to do. Not, not one thing to the detriment of another, but all of the things that you have called us to do, that we might be salt and light in, even into this world, that we might meet needs wherever we, we find them and declare the God of heaven loves the world and loves the community that we are a part of. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have spent together around your word. And I pray, Lord, as we uh, go through the next few days, Lord, that you will be with us, you would keep us safe, and you would comfort us and you would be whatever we stand in need of. We think of the situation in, the, in our nation, Lord, and, and in the world. We pray that you would have your way even amongst that, that your will would be done, and that the hearts of men and women might turn to you, even in this situation, Lord, and find a God who is loving and who is gracious and who is ever welcoming to them. Continue to be with us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>